A life spent in Canadian politics, at least the way I've chosen to live it, takes you to a lot of remote places. Combine that with over 25 years in public opinion polling, and you see clearly just how important rural Canada is to our country, its people, its talents, and its rhythms. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, couldn't agree more. TELUS will tell you themselves that there's a lot more work to do, but they know just how important it is to connect rural Canadians to high-speed internet, and they've demonstrated their leadership in rural connectivity for many years. From 2015 to 2019, they invested almost $400 million in new cell site builds and capacity upgrades for rural Canada. In the wake of this pandemic, TELUS accelerated broadband investments in rural Alberta and BC. They've expanded wireless LTE coverage in Indigenous communities from 466 reserves to more than 1,900. And over the next five years, TELUS is planning to increase wireless service to an additional 3.5 million rural Canadians. They do it because TELUS believes in bridging digital divides so that all Canadians are connected to the technology and resources we need to live our lives. You can learn much more by going to connectingcanadaforgood.ca or you can just keep tuning in to hear what an old pollster has to say about it on the Hurley Burley. All right, just before we get to today's pod, I want to give you Hurley Burleyites a heads up about a brand new video first podcast we've been working on here at Air Quotes Media Worldwide Headquarters. It's called Hurley Burley Through the Looking Glass, presented by TELUS. And it's not the Hurley Burley you're used to. I'm not interviewing political figures or journalists. Scott and Jenny won't be joining me to swear up a storm. I'm taking viewers through the looking glass of a focus group boardroom, all done virtually, of course, and into the minds of four groups of your fellow Canadians, one black, one white, one indigenous, and one Asian. It's a multi-episode exploration of the issue of race in Canada. Our political and media class often likes to rally around the notion that diversity is our strength in this country, but how strong are we really? I'm your focus group moderator for what is a fragile and emotional exploration of a deeply complicated conversation with everyday Canadians from one coast to the other. We shot the thing just a couple of weeks ago. We're editing the show right now, and we'll have it ready for you by the end of October. More details to come in a couple of weeks, and I hope you tune in. Curiously good-looking and responsible mask-wearing hurly burlyites let's get to the pod. We've got yet another two-parter for you. First up is John Stackhouse making an almost unprecedented return to the Hurley Burley today. Besides being the only guest other than the great Ken Dryden to ever actually agree to do a second show with us, our original interview with John is one of the top 10 most listened to shows in our history. So we can tell there's an audience people want to hear John we've brought him back you all know who he is he spent close to a quarter century at the Globe and Mail as a foreign correspondent editor of the report on business and then finally editor-in-chief today he's a senior vice president office of the CEO at the Royal Bank of Canada where he advises leadership on emerging trends in the Canadian economy he's also the author of a new book launching tomorrow planet Canada how our expats are shaping the future which argues that our country's greatest untapped resource may be the three million Canadians who don't live here anymore. We'll talk about that, plus we'll dive deep into the COVID and post-COVID economy. For part two, we'll bring on our political panel, those creators of memorable strategies and utterers of vivid expletives, Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. Not shockingly, we're gonna do a lot of Trump talk today. The garden party seems to be over for the Trump campaign. We'll talk a little bit about what it feels like when a campaign is deteriorating that badly, what Team Trump should be doing to stem the bleeding, besides jumping in limos and having impromptu hospital parades. We'll also talk about what the down-ballot Republican candidates might be thinking about doing to distance themselves. Tomorrow night, Mike Pence squares off against Kamala Harris. So many people are looking forward to that, but has a vice presidential debate ever mattered? The Green Party has a new leader, Annamie Paul. And we'll take a question for our listener mailbag. So with all that, John Stackhouse, welcome back to the Hurley Burley. Hey, David. It's great to see you from, of course, a, uh, a great distance now. Thanks for having, ha- having me back. 
Last time uh, we did this, we were literally sitting in chairs a couple of feet away from each other. Yes. And uh, so this is a, a little set. bit different. I miss your drum set. <laughs> I'm thinking of it. I miss my drum set. I'm very proud of my drum set. So uh, how are you, man? I haven't well, talked I'm, to you since this whole thing began. How, yeah, I'm, how I'm, you doing? I'm, I'm well, thanks. I mean, this, this is obviously beyond weird for everyone in different ways, but uh, I'm among the lucky ones. Probably most of us feel, feel that way. We live in a great country, have a great health care system. Uh, society largely seems to be working together on this. You know, I like to stress there is no downside to wearing a freaking mask. So, you know, wear one when you're around other people, especially strangers, not a big deal. Uh, so it's good to see Canadians just kind of take that pragmatic uh, approach to uh, to this crisis, but it's not over. What's your what's your personal state of anxiety like about this? It's weird to uh, I, I still find it weird to be out in crowds. Not, not that I'm in big crowds, but walking down a street in downtown Toronto, being in a mall. Um, it's just that there's the sidewalk dance that goes on. I, I sometimes even yeah, find yeah, myself yeah. sort of ducking behind a tree uh, just because of that discomfort of, uh, of of being around other other people. I hope we get over that. I, I hope that doesn't become kind of a uh, ingrained in our in our uh, in our psyche. Yeah, yeah. So let's get let's get right to let's get right to the book. Planet Canada, here it is for our viewing audience. Planet Canada, How Our Expats Are Shaping Our Future by John Stackhouse. So first of all, I want to say that I'm extremely glad that you wrote this book and I'm extremely glad that I read this book because I learned something very, very important. And that is that Kiss did not write their only good song. Uh, that Beth was in fact written by a Canadian, great Canadian producer by the name of Bob Ezrin. So I had always thought that I had to give Kiss at least one kudo for a decent tune, and now I know I can write them off completely. So thank you, John, for your efforts in this uh, in this book. David, that is brilliant, and and, and you've clearly read the book because that is a uh, a fact buried in one of the uh, later later chapters. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tight. and now I can't get Beth out of my head. I'll, I'll be, yeah, be <laughs> Beth, I hear them calling. Well, Beth, what can I do? Uh, I know. <laughs> That's the only thing you remember about that band. Anyway, uh, you wrote this. I, I had some weird feelings reading the book because it felt like such a different era because you were traveling everywhere and meeting people in different locations and hanging around with crowds of people in Silicon Valley and in India. and So uh, that must feel... Like a totally different world for you right now. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I really hope we get back to it uh, soon. Not for myself, but just because it's important for humans to uh, to interact. We're a social social species, which I think the book uh, gets at. Canadians uh, are, are part of that social species. We like to get out in the world, like to make a difference in uh, in the world. So hopefully, we're just in the middle of uh, of a recess. But uh, yeah, COVID kind of uh, threw. I, I mean, it's. It's an understatement to say a wrench at this because we had it ready to go at the beginning of this year and then everything went into lockdown and the publisher said, let's let's pause this until until the fall. And it forced me to reflect on how the core thesis of the book, the argument, has been disrupted by by this crisis. So the argument is right. we've got, as you said, three million Canadians living, working, studying outside the country. They are our secret weapon. They're our 11th province. Uh, and we do nothing to take advantage or do very little to take advantage of them, unlike Israel, Singapore, India, uh, pretty much every other country in the world right now is working with, with their expats. So during this crisis, I've come to appreciate how this population is more valuable than ever because we can't go anywhere and they are still out there. There are Canadians in kind of every corner of Silicon Valley. There are Canadians in the far corners of Africa, throughout Asia, doing incredible things, even in lockdown. And we need to help them help Canada uh, as we kind of think about being and regaining some relevance in the uh, in the 2020s. So that's the basic thesis of the book, if I'm not going to state it incorrectly, which is that uh, there are 
millions of Canadians, uh, people of Canadian extraction or Canadian history uh, around the world. They tend to be highly talented people because they were mobile and 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 uh, are obviously doing well in a globally competitive environment. They perhaps have left Canada because the opportunity they were seeking wasn't here and it was somewhere else. So they're a very talented group of people by and large, well-connected, and that we need to be taking some advantage of this group of people, using this group of people to help benefit Canada back here, and that that is, well, let me just stop there. So that's the thesis, that we need to mobilize or... Um, work with expats in order to build um, up Canada. What, why is that important, John? What can they do for us here? Well, I, I think one of the lessons of the Security Council defeat was that our position in the world has changed. And that's that's okay. I think Canadians have to kind of get, uh, get on and move beyond the personian image of not just ourselves, but of, 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 of the world. We are incredibly valued in the world, but our relevance is different. Our share of everything, of GDP, of military spending, of development spending, of peacekeeping has been in decline and our share of population will continue to be in decline. That's okay, uh, but it means we have to think differently about our, our place in the world. And it's a world that's become powered much more by networks than by institutions. So in a way it doesn't, you know, the Security Council matters, but we need to concern ourselves less with those institutions and more with the people networks that are really shaping history. So what, what are the great forces of 2020 beyond the virus? Well, Greta Thunberg uh, leads a network that is more powerful than many governments uh, on this planet. Donald Trump's army <laughs> beyond the GOP is you know, probably the most powerful political force in, uh, in America. And perhaps the most significant one this year is Black Lives Matter. There is a network effect there that is forcing change on the world. Most of those networks are very positive in what they do. Expats can form similarly networks for their home countries. And, you know, I mentioned Israel and Singapore and India before. They are developing really interesting networks, digital networks, with their global populations to connect the country with all sorts of things going on in the world way beyond government. And that's, I think that that's a really exciting opportunity for Canada and Canadians to realize we punch way above our weight, to use the cliche. There's disproportionately Canadians kind of everywhere, which is why I started the book. Everywhere I went in the world through the 90s and 2000s, I was bumping into Canadians doing usually pretty impressive things. There's some scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells and, and, and criminals out there, and I, I get to some of those in, uh, in the book, but for the most part, they're doing really good things and really interesting things. And they want to help Canada. They feel like they've become detached from their country. And we're not doing enough to help them help us. So that's, that, that's the, the, the key message of the book is. So they do want to help, eh? Because yeah. sometimes when I think of the type of people we're talking about, I think of this elite crust of the world's population that is more connected to itself than it is to any particular piece of geography and really have lost their detachment. And, you know, I mean, there was the odd thing in the book that irritated me because um, I'm a little bit of a lefty on, and nationalist on some of these things. But it was this uh, Air Canada, former Air Canada executive, who wondering why his compatriots lacked the boldness he injected into Air Canada's rebranding in 2017 when the airline ditched some of its maple leaf cliches for a more stylish and sleek black and white design that says to the world, we've arrived. That, uh, you know, uh, that, that sounds to me like somebody that's trying to escape their Canadian roots, not somebody that's, em that's embracing them. That, that, that got under your skin, David. That's uh, that's curious. Uh, I think it did get Tyler, under my skin. Yeah, yeah, I think that was Tyler Brule, who uh, is, is from Winnipeg, where you know so many great Canadians come uh, come from. And Tyler founded Monocle. He left in the early '90s uh, and uh, has, has been largely based in Europe and Asia, and is still very much attached to 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 Canada. And there's a guy who is very influential in uh, global media. Uh, has deep connections in the travel and fashion industries, 
and wants to help Canada and is not being used uh, used actively enough. You know, we know about the Mark Carneys, or you know, I, I, I profiled Jim Cameron, the movie director uh, there. There's lots of famous Canadians, but way, way more Canadians you've never heard of. People like the, there's the guy Rafer Wallace, who's a, you know, one of China's first green architects and has been kind of an architectural revolutionary in China and has built up a global business in China that is now employing software engineers in Quebec. Uh, I, I find that fascinating. He, he moved from uh, Quebec to Shanghai, where he's lived for 20 years, created a multinational that is now employing people in, uh, in Quebec. That's the way the world pre-COVID was going. We'll get back to something like that post-COVID. The challenge with people like Rafer is no one from Canada is reaching out. He's doing this on his own. No one's saying, wait a second, here's this guy in Shanghai who's having all sorts of impact on China, uh, who we need to work with and help him help, uh, help, help us. And you know, dozens of stories like that uh, in the book of Canadians who you know, are, are fairly modest in that Canadian way, uh, but are very proud of, of, of being Canadian. And it isn't just jingoism, um, or it is not jingoism. I found the more Canadians I interviewed, the more they appreciated what Canada had given them. A sense of um, mutual accommodation, uh, which there's probably some people rolling their eyes right now to hear that. But that is a, a, a Canadian strength, which we kind of take for granted because it's just how we are. Um, and, you know, we're not perfect at it. But mutual accommodation is how this country was formed. It's how we function uh, and how we function well most of the time. And Canadians, whether they're in business or in Hollywood or in tech or uh, in the NGO world, uh, will tell you, or they certainly told me, that that sense of mutual accommodation, of being able to bridge difference, is an incredibly powerful and valued strength in the world. And as I say, we take it for granted and then people get out in the world and realize, wait, people around most tables actually aren't interested in difference. Um, is Dominic Barton, who's now, the, the, as you know, the, the ambassador to China, who I interviewed uh, a few times for the book, who said when he was at McKinsey, he always knew when there was a Canadian in the room because they were the ones who asked questions and listened to answers. Now, he said, the Dutch are also like that. So I had to wait for the accent to know if they were Canadian or Dutch. But it's just how we are raised. It's how we conduct ourselves largely as a society. We listen, we respect difference, and we try to accommodate difference. And the world is going to need a whole lot more of that. I think we can agree uh, coming, coming out of this. So Canadians, by and large, out there are not saying to the world, be like Canada. Uh, in fact, a number say that's one of our strengths. We don't tell other, other countries, hey, you got to be like us. We're kind of apologetic. We'll say sorry for our mutual accommodation, but actually, this is how we <laughs> how we work things out in uh, in our country. We have things like equalization or uh, or universal um, public health care, uh, and our approach to education and so on are things that the, the much of the world wants to uh, wants to learn from. So the trick now for our country is to help those at that uh, I call it the the eleventh province. Uh, help them build build Canada's uh, place in a very very different world of the 2020s. So how can they do how can they do that? What is the ask? What would how would the government organize itself, and what would we be asking these people to do? We have to f let them take things in their own direction, which is hard for governments and bureaucracies to do. In a way, expats are almost uh, antithetical to bureaucrats, and I don't say that dismissively of bureaucrats, but most bureaucrats, by their very nature, live within a system. They live by rules and by process. Many, if not most expats, I mean, to leave your country is a big life decision. Uh, and to stay away from your country, from your home, from your original friendship, uh, your original circles of friendship, is, uh, and to leave a comfortable country like Canada is not an easy decision. So they tend to be, uh, if not rebels, and a lot of them are rebels or vagabonds, um, they like to chart their own path. 
So let them too ambitious the for Canada. A lot of them seem to be describing themselves. So yeah, some well, the, the, yeah, they 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 want something bigger. They want to take on the world. Uh, so let them take on the world for for Canada. Form let let them form networks. But we got to help them form networks. So the, the, the C one hundred, which I uh, profile in the book, is an organization of Canadians in Silicon Valley who have been uh, working for 10 years now. It's a volunteer, volunteer association, nonprofit, that helps not just Canadians in the Valley, but helps Canada. And they advise, they've advised both the Harper and the Trudeau governments on tax policy, on innovation policy, on immigration. They bring uh, startup founders to the Valley to learn from Canadians there, but also from non, non-Canadians there. That's a really good model. So how do we take the C100 and turn it into the C1 million and have that in Brazil, in Mexico, in Dubai, uh, where Canadians get together, but it's usually like to watch a hockey game or have a, a, a Canada Day party. That, that's fine. But how do we do something more, more constructive? I think, secondly, we have to ensure our governments and 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 private organizations, businesses and nonprofits, listen and learn from them. This is a really knowledgeable uh, group. Uh, it's beyond a group, it's th- uh, two to three million people uh, who we have to get better feedback from. Say like, what's what's going on in the world? And we've, we've seen this in, uh, in, in, in COVID. Um, Tim Evans, who runs McGill's um, uh, global health program, uh, has lived, had lived outside of the country for 20, 30 years, uh, moved back just before COVID last fall. And I talked to him um, for, the, for the book, but also talked to him last week. And he now leads uh, one of the task forces on, um, on uh, immunization for the virus. He's a medical doctor, uh, one of the world's kind of mo- most respected people on global health issues. And he said, it, it's remarkable being back in Canada talking to medical experts in this country, incredibly smart, committed people, as well as public health officials in, in the federal and provincial governments who don't think beyond our borders. They're not thinking, which is a little disturbing or at least concerning, because this is a global health crisis. How do we find the Canadians in the WHO, and there are plenty there, or in the CDC, or in health uh, organizations, and there are plenty, you know, from China to to France, engaged in the uh, the battle against COVID. How do we connect with them directly and learn from learn from them? I think that's a huge opportunity that's just waiting there for any uh, government that wants to pick up the phone. I don't think governments are organized to do what you're talking about. <laughs> to pick up the phone? <laughs> no, well, actually, no, they're not. Who would who would do that? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's, it's always interesting to uh, to talk to government leaders uh, about that. And so much, as you know, from your years in government, it's scheduled and, and really scheduled, programmed. And some of the best leaders are the ones who just spontaneously pick up the phone and say, hey, it's... Um, it's David Hurley calling, uh, sort of bother you, but I um, wonder if you might tell me a thing or two about whatever it is. But yeah, you're, I mean, gov- yeah, that goes against the grain of, of uh, most systems. Well, that sort of, um, uh, per- like, because you're describing something that requires a bit of finesse, a bit of a personal touch. It's not a... It's not a structural thing. It's not like you, it doesn't feel like you could just delegate it to every uh, consul uh, to execute exactly. on this thing. It, they, they, would crush, so, they would crush it. And, and, and right. you know, I've got a uh, lot of respect for what our, our overseas missions do. They're, they're really incredible at what they do. But this is, as I say, it's almost antithetical to them. So it needs to be done outside of, uh, outside of the usual lines. I've, I've suggested in the book that, that um, Rideau Hall, the governor general, be given responsibility for this and become almost like the, <laughs> the, the uh, <laughs> chief. <laughs> so, um, but, but David Johnson, you know, the previous governor general, was very, um, very interested right. in this. And he spent a lot of his time when he went a- abroad meeting with expats because he got it. He truly gets it. He would pull together Canadians not for a photo op, 
but to say what what do what can you tell me about Brazil? I'm in Brazil, um, uh, which is a true story. Tell me what I'm not hearing from our usual channels. So how do we um, formalize that and get get our expats feeding back through, let's say, the governor general, better intel on the world that that, that can then go to government and not be filtered uh, through the usual usual channels. So I was I was actually involved um, in government politics in the '90s when the brain '90s early 2000s yeah. when the brain drain dis, you know argument was going on and uh, uh, you know there were people that were urging that we needed to reduce taxes and create incentives for for people to stay that we had this massive wave of talented people leaving the country and. Um, I never heard anybody frame things the way you framed them in this book, in the sense that there were people who argued that this was a terrible thing, uh, the brain drain, and we must alter public policy in order to keep people in the country. And then there were people that said either oh, it's not substantially happening or who cares if it is happening. Uh, we're not going to lower our taxes just to keep those people in the country. But nobody was saying, hey, this is great. Uh, people are leaving and they're taking important jobs in other places and they're going to be able to help us. And that feels counterintuitive to me as a, as a thesis, John, in the sense that I thought every country in the world was in a pitched battle to attract talent to its country. So why would we be ambivalent about talent leaving ours? Yeah, we have, I frame it as brain circulation. We have to see the world as one of movement. People leave, they come back. Um, but just because people leave Canada doesn't make them less Canadian. It's one of the core points of, of, of the book. So let's, you know, sure, fight to get them back, fight to keep talent. I've got nothing against that per se, but reality is talent, talent goes where talent is. People want to be in the game, whatever their, their, their game is. And, and there are other reasons there's, there's marriage, there's life decisions that no government can, uh, kind of, uh, work, work against. Um, so let's you know, go with the current. And if you've got a bunch of Canadians in Silicon Valley or in Nashville, as I profile in the book, sure, try to get some of them to move back. Reality is most do not move back, regardless of country. Lots of studies over the decades have shown that once people leave their country, especially once they're gone five years, odds are they're not coming back. And that's okay. Um, help them be, you know, it's a... a uh, a Canadian in the Valley named Scott Bonham, who said, like, I'm more valuable to Canada here than I would be back in Canada. And I think he's right. Like, he's doing way more for the country there than here. So that's a, an example of what we can, what we can do more of. But understand this, this power of networks, that people like Scott can connect us with 100 people in the Valley. So when you go to the Valley or the Prime Minister goes to the Valley or, or my CEO goes to the Valley, people like Scott can say, you know, I can pull together 10, 20, 50 of the most interesting people, Canadian and not, who you might not otherwise meet. That's the power of, uh, that's the power of networks. And you don't need to go there, right? You, you, you can do all this, uh, you can do all this uh, digitally. So we need to think a bit beyond geography. And also understand, I mean, we, we attract more talent than we lose. And that's been the, the Canadian story for 30 years. So I, I spent a chapter on this brain drain debate because I, I remember how pitched it was in the 90s. And, uh, you know, I probably wrote a few headlines that uh, added to the pitched nature of, of, of the battle. But there's a lot of good <laughs> academic research that shows it's, uh, it, it, it's overstated as a problem. Uh, we gain more than we lose. Um, it goes in cycles. It can be very particular to professions. So the, the I, I think what probably you remember, or maybe one of the things you, David, remember most clearly is the, the, the brain drain of doctors and nurses, which, you know, was what got people panicky that, you know, we'd, we'd have no doctors and nurses uh, through the 1990s. That was, you know, now with the benefit of hindsight, um, driven in, in, to some degree by the boom of uh, HMOs in the US in the 1980s, the business model changed. And there was suddenly a incredible demand for doctors and nurses in places like Texas. 
So they got, and, and then NAFTA created more liberal visas. So the flow began. But at the same time, doctors and nurses were coming from around the world to Canada. So, you know, net net, we came out okay. Uh, the same is happening with software engineers. There's a lot of debate about why do we subsidize the education of a software engineer at, let's say, the University of Waterloo so that Google can hire them uh, immediately and move them to, to, to the Valley? That, and, and that's an important point for Canadians to debate. Should there be a kind of a, a, a refund that, that people have to leave upon departure for their education? Kind of hard to administer, but be an interesting, uh, interesting point to debate. But for all those, those software engineers that go, we gain more. And more critically, we're losing the opportunity to network with them where, wherever they are. So you find Canadians, you know, there's a, there's a chapter on Google in the book. And Eric Schmidt, uh, the, f- the former executive chairman of, of Google, uh, who I spoke to for the book, said, you know, if, there was, um, if, 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 if Google were a country, it would probably be Canada. And, you know, Canadians may bristle at that who don't like Google. But if you spend time at the Googleplex um, in uh, Mountain View, it is, um, it, it is like the United Nations. But there's a ton of Canadians there. And there's a certain that mutual accommodation idea. Um, you wouldn't hear, hear many Googlies use that term, but uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, very, it's very much part of the culture, being inclusive, being open to debate, uh, being a little less hierarchical. Than, uh, than most places. Uh, you do describe in the book a, a, a high-level, coordinated effort at what you're talking about when um, Mr. Trudeau first became Prime Minister and enlisted Dominic Barton to be his connector-in-chief. Um, what has happened to that initiative? I think uh, it, it, it's kind of been in uh, neutral. So the, the what happened was it, in Trudeau's first trip to Davos, um, he, uh, he asked uh, Barton to bring together Canadians who were there. And that included, uh, Barton has an incredible global network. And among those he was able to bring together was Mark Carney uh, and Mike Evans. And okay, Carney, you know, Trudeau could get a meeting with Carney uh, probably pretty easily on his own. But what I found uh, fascinating was, was Trudeau and his team had no idea who Mike Evans was. And Mike Evans is you know, former Goldman Sachs executive, uh, son of John Evans, you know, former U of T president, great, uh, really great uh, Canadian. Um, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, and Mike's been in Asia most of his working life and is president of Alibaba, you know, one of the top tech executives in China. Um, who knew <laughs> that a Canadian, right. and this is twenty early twenty sixteen, that a Canadian was was building Alibaba globally, and uh, Evans was able to advise the the Trudeau team on how to think about the platform economy, and within a year was able to get Jack Ma to Toronto for a big. Um, it was an announcement, but uh, but a but a program for Canadian small business to sell um, whatever we produce to uh, to China. That actually went uh, went really well. Um, you know, things things have gone uh, sideways or south, uh, and you know we can get into that over the last uh, over the last couple of years. But the spirit of that should not be lost. That uh, there was a Canadian who no one really knew about or was dealing with actively who was able to give Canada a strategic advantage when Jack Ma and Alibaba are not probably lying awake at night thinking, how do we penetrate the Canadian market? <laughs> or how do we get more Canadians selling on Alibaba? And they're not against Canada. It's just not, you know, in, in top, top of mind, not a 10, top 10 issue. So it's a chance for us to kind of push our, our uh, priorities, our you know, and our strategy into that top 10 list by, by using people like, 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 a, like a Mike Evans. Very interesting. Very interesting. And I was uh, so thrilled to see uh, Jennifer Welsh mentioned in your book. Jennifer and I go back a long, long way to elementary school. So, and she's, um, uh, 
you know, she's been uh, on, you know, on this message and advocating for this for, for decades. You know, this is not an original idea. And I'm, I'm glad you picked up on, on Jennifer because I try to attribute in the book lots of good thinking that has gone into this over, over the years and, 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 and should cross party lines. Uh, I, I don't see this as a partisan issue. This is something that all Canadians can, can, can benefit uh, benefit from. So glad you picked up on, on Jennifer's points. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, can we talk about the economy for a little bit, switch gears and talk about the economy for a little bit? We, we, we may lose uh, our last few listeners here, David, but of course. No, you know what? The Actually, the ratings, if you look at such things, which we don't, if you care about how your audience reacts, uh, you know, you'll pollute your product. But Nonetheless, if you look at ratings, people, when we have people on here talking about the economy, we get more listeners than normal. So let's fire right. away. So this is David. Take where you this have down. To say, you know, after, 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 after our break, we'll be back to talk about home prices. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That'll, that'll bring people back in huge numbers. There, that's, it, nothing, that's, the, uh, that's, the, that's the hook. Well, I, whole, I want to get to that. Go ahead. What? No, I was going to say nothing captivates Canadians like uh, quite like home 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 prices. We're a nation of uh, obsessed with it. So, where is the, what is the current status of the Canadian economy? Can you compare our situation, our condition, to previous recessions or downturns, or what are we in? Right now, no, you can't. You, you, you can't compare this to anything because it is dependent week to week, month to month on the virus. Economic logic does not work on its own in this environment because we have this virus that is more powerful than probably any economic variable out there. But what, to be that as it may, what we've seen coming out of uh, summer is the Canadian economy doing a little better, probably than most had anticipated in the spring. Uh, it, you know, it's it's still devastating what's happened. So I don't want to put uh, kind of a sunny picture on this, but things were starting to pick up coming out of fall. Uh, employment creation was was decent. Um, business closure was less than uh, probably had been anticipated for 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 that point. And consumers were spending. We do uh, at you know my day job at RBC. Uh, we track consumer spending. We publish this through a, a regular consumer tracker. Canadians have been spending more than a year ago. Um, David, you'll like this. Canadians have been one of the reasons is we seem to spend more uh, on golf this summer than uh, than previous summers. <laughs> I mean, ge- genuinely, we, we did spend less on on restaurants, more on golf, um, less on long distance travel, more on local local travel. A lot of shopping, a lot of home improvement, ton of home improvement. So the consumer side of the economy had had been going. And has been going, uh, you know, the, according to the most recent data, has been going okay. Uh, part of that is the CERB. Part of it is uh, relief on things like uh, mortgage payments. Uh, and part of it is, you know, we're all sitting around and have surplus savings because we're not buying big things or going on. It's cheaper on to live in the things. pandemic. Yeah. So, um, so the consumer has been, has been good. Um, small business has been devastated and getting that consumer spending more into the hands of, uh, of small business is going to be a key challenge for the winter. And then investment is, is a real challenge because there's so much uncertainty. But it also depends on the part of the economy. Manufacturing has been coming back okay, uh, in part because you know, we're buying things like cars. So the auto sector is, uh, pardon the expression, but revving up uh, a little bit more, and that that um, that helps Canada. Factories here are working, um, you know, at, at at reasonable capacity. The oil and gas sector, the opposite. Uh, you know, um, a very damaging year there for COVID reasons, but non-COVID reasons as uh, as as well. You are, uh, you know a lot about disruption and I'm, I'm having trouble because I don't know anything about economics or business, either one, ask my partners. Um, <laughs> so the restaurant industry, um, 
I mean, like the Ontario government's trying to save it by not closing it down when probably the health advice would be to close it down. Uh, and I understand that to be a tough decision, but it feels to me like I don't know how it survives the winter anyway. I mean, I'm not going into a restaurant. Um, and I don't think most people are going to go into restaurants from the polling data that I've seen. So what happens? Does literally like every restaurant go under in Canada and then a whole new crop of restaurants springs up or what, what is going to happen in an industry like that, which I don't literally see how any of them survives. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a deep, deep challenge, David. And so much de does depend on the virus and the, uh, the coming weeks, but it's going to be a tough, tough winter for restaurants. When we look, step back um, to try to understand what's going on, Canadians are spending probably in aggregate more on food uh today than a year ago uh, we're just spending it differently so grocery spending has has been doing really well uh, online grocery spending has actually grown in the crisis so it would appear canadians are more comfortable with having food delivered to our doorsteps i think we all we all get that uh, so how do we even as a bridge through winter help and it's probably not going to help all restaurants but help a critical mass of them switch business models, which many of them have, have started to do, but they're going to have to probably switch yeah. even more and they'll, they'll require assistance to do that, to still do what restaurants do, which is cook great food. And rather than bring it to a table, they're going to bring it to your door. Um, we've all been doing that over the, la over the summer uh, and we can do it even more in the, uh, in, in the winter. And I suspect the government is, is looking, you know, the UK had a, a very interesting program in August where the government picked up a share of your restaurant bill or your pub bill. Yeah. We may want to think about something similar, but rather than going to the restaurant, the restaurant will come, come to you. Logistics are, are, are a challenge in all this. Um, and also a challenge in all this is to ensure that a fair share of what you pay on your phone uh, goes to the restaurateur because there are a lot of middlemen uh, in between, including the the phone, uh, the platform on the phone, the delivery service. If it is a um, you know a uh, one one of the service companies we're all using, sometimes the actual restaurateur is getting much less of that um, meal, the fifty bucks you um, might have dropped or whatever the amount is, than they would have had you drop the $50 on a, 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 a dinner for two in their, in their establishment. So some, in, some, some uh, interesting challenges there to, to work out to ensure that the restaurateurs are getting, uh, getting their share. But um, restaurants are um, not only great for us as consumers, they're, and, and underestimated in terms of their value to communities, to main streets, to small streets and small towns. The restaurant is, is the hub. Uh, they're really critical employers in the country. Uh, for every dollar you spend at a restaurant, you're creating more jobs than a dollar spent uh, in a lot of other activities. And they are really valuable employers for first-time jobs. I think many of us can, can speak to that. So we, we, we cannot underestimate what we lose when we lose that entry level job. They're really valuable for, um, for part-time work, uh, for, for people who have other, other things, including students. Uh, yeah. So let's not underestimate the value. It's not just the restaurateur who's at risk. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of Canadians, maybe it goes into the millions of Canadians who depend on restaurants for, uh, for employment. And that's, that's not easy to uh, that's not easy to replicate. How come housing prices haven't collapsed in this COVID economy? I'm just I'm I'm doing a tech change here, David, because my my plug like the classic COVID. Um, I'm getting signaled that I'm about to run low on battery, um, so I'm not ducking the question. I'm just uh, don't don't want to lose the, uh, the, the the power here. Um, <laughs> COVID podcasting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a great question, David. Um, so demand and supply, uh, housing prices are a mathematical outcome by and large supply and demand. 
And one of the things we have in this country is reasonably solid and predictable population growth. Uh, that's been disrupted, and I'll get to that. But uh, increasingly, predominantly now through immigration. And that has been critical for many years to the housing market. On the supply side, we do not create enough housing, uh, especially uh, single family, uh, but even multifamily dwellings in this country for the number of new households that are being created, especially in, uh, in large centers. So during the crisis, immigration has, uh, has decreased significantly. So that is going to have a temporary hit on housing prices, which we think we are seeing in the condo and rental market uh, where prices have declined because that is often the entry point for new Canadians. You come to Canada, you buy a condo or you rent a condo while you look for a home. Makes, makes sense. Yeah. So the, the condo market um, is uh, facing more headwinds than the single family uh, home market, which there just aren't enough houses. Add to that the demographic shifts. So millennials moving in, in big numbers into, um, into home ownership stage, which tends to happen in the 30s, at a time when money is incredibly cheap. Where you can, you, you know, you can, if, especially if you're a two income family, which most young families are, you can get into the housing market. It's, it's tight. Um, affordability has been a challenge, although afford, affordability has, has improved in the crisis. We can get to that. Uh, so there is more demand from younger Canadians for their own homes, and they can afford it because interest rates are so low. Older Canadians appear not willing to want to sell and move quite in numbers that one might expect. The, the retiring boomers, uh, who we all know and love, um, maybe, uh, and this is early to say, but maybe this is because of concern over COVID, not wanting to move into a condo, for instance. Let's, let's keep the house for one more year until there's a vaccine, and then we'll move into a condo or a retirement home. And then the exodus, um, which we're seeing to the suburbs, Housing prices are strong in the suburbs and to smaller towns, smaller communities uh, in the periphery of the big, uh, the, the big metros. So different variables of supply and demand there, David, that generally are supportive of where prices are. Okay. Um, is there going to be a relatively smooth transition out of the mortgage deferral program? Uh that's probably a question I shouldn't answer being at a, a, a bank, but uh, I think we're in a real-time situation in October on all credit uh, coming out of fall, how, how many people are still going to be able to uh, pay their debts. Generally, we feel pretty good. The, the, the ability to pay um, is strong. Savings are way up in this country. Uh, people are you know, stashing away money. Uh, for a bunch of reasons that, uh, uh, that are interesting. But uh, there's, there's a, a, a strong amount of savings out there. So there aren't real worrisome signs, but the longer this goes on, uh, the higher unemployment is. And unemployment is the key kind of driver of challenges on, uh, re on, on the repayments front, whether it's mortgages or credit cards or other, other debts. But un unemployment's been coming down. But that comes back to the point I was making, well, we were talking about with restaurants, but it applies more broadly across the economy. Getting people back to work is, and I don't envy any government in this, these are incredibly difficult decisions with a huge number of unknowns. But getting people back to work is, is a critical challenge for, uh, for the winter. Are you a fan of build back better or are you a build back normal guy? Um, build, well, I just like to build back. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's a slogan. I don't know what better means because my better may, is probably different from your better. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I get the, the, the slogan effect. Um, we have to build back differently. And, and I don't mean that in a political sense. The economy is going to function differently coming out of uh, this crisis 
functions differently coming out of, uh, out of any recession than it would going into it. Uh, and this recession is unique. So we will need um, all sorts of different infrastructure. We will need uh, digital capabilities and digital infrastructure to uh, enable, it's a bit of a gushy word, mushy word, but uh, mm. enable a different kind of economy. You talk about those restaurants. Um, most Canadian restaurants have very limited uh, to weak digital capabilities, really weak going into this crisis. The ones that have survived have, uh, have upped their game, but they need to up their game even more. They need digital capabilities for that. We need much better broadband right uh, across the country. So those sorts of investments, I guess that, you know, you can call that build back better. I, I just think that's kind of a, a smarter economic policy for this kind of, uh, for this kind of recovery. We're going to need a much greater focus on skills training because there's, there's going to be a lot of underemployed and unemployed people who will need different skills uh, for the 2020s. They probably needed that a year or two ago, but now we really need that. So how do we ensure that uh, a good chunk of the stimulus goes to helping colleges and universities and even private educators help Canadians in a real-time way develop the skills to get back to uh, those jobs that, uh, that, are, that are going to be out there, mm. including the jobs that are out there today. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of jobs in the trades, for instance, that are, that are going unfilled. So, you know, we need to move more quickly on the skills front to help people be ready uh, for, uh, for those kinds of jobs. There doesn't seem to be any operating theory right now about fiscal or monetary policy. What do you think are some reasonable guidelines as to what kind of spending the Canadian government can afford? Yeah, there's been some good debate about this. And David Dodge published what I thought was an excellent paper through the public policy forum where he outlined a pathway uh, back to, not even back to balance, just back to a, uh, a more sustainable capacity. And I don't think there is strong disagreement with that, that model of, of, of taking our deficit down uh, kind of percent by percent of GDP uh, over a three to five year period. I think most people probably in, in finance would would agree with that kind of approach. The challenge in the immediate, uh, in October 2020, is how long is the virus going to be with us? Are we going to be in an economic lockdown or, or slowdown for another 12 months, or is it another 12 weeks? And I think the government wants to keep its, um, keep its options. Governments all, uh, always want to keep their options open. At some point pretty soon, and I, 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 it's got to be in the next few months in our view, it would be very helpful for the government to lay out a path like that. And any business decision maker would, I think, agree or tell you that you, make a path, you, you, you lay out a path, a plan, and then you prepare to pivot. If circumstances change, you adjust. And Canadians, I think, would, would accept that. If we say, you know, this is our deficit target for 2021, 22, 23, and then if the virus is still with us, you know, God forbid, next summer, I think Canadians would totally get that whoever is in government at that time would have to stand up and say, things have changed, we have to adjust our plan. So make a plan, prepare to pivot. Uh, that and And then... Uh, people can start to navigate, like, why does this matter? Well, well, people have to start to make decisions, including investors, including the people who buy our debt, need to, we've got a, a degree of forgiveness now because the whole world is in this. That's not going to last. You know, at some point, someone is going to call up from somewhere and say, hello, Canada, what's your plan? Because I own X billion of your <laughs> debt and I need to I need to know the plan that's okay I, I, that, that, that's okay so let's start to work towards having an answer to to that question that call's not going to come this month it's not going to come next month but 
you know, and, and this can be a metaphorical call. I'm not trying to be too dramatic about it, uh, but you've been in the room for that kind of uh, that kind of call. We have to be prepared for it. John, thank you for this. Thanks for spending the time. Super, super, super interesting as always. I can't recommend this book highly enough because, as John said, there's some famous people in here, and you'll learn a little bit about them, but there's a ton of not famous but really interesting and talented Canadians who've got great stories and great perspectives on Canada. So it's a super, super interesting read, and... uh I encourage folks to uh, to pick it up. And, and John, I look forward to an opportunity to get my copy signed. David, I'll, I'll, I'll do that with pleasure. It's always great to uh, chat with you. I hope you stay well and uh, keep, keep well. Stay safe. Okay. When you come on three more times, you'll get the Red Smokers jacket for the five-time Hurley Burley appearance. Is there, is there going to be a mask to go with it? <laughs> there, or, I or hope maybe not by, by that point, but maybe. Not, okay. yeah. <laughs> maybe just like a little church up or something. <laughs> All right, brother. Thanks, thank David. You. So last spring, around the same time as the pandemic was arriving in Canada, about 40,000 tons of rock and gravel came roaring down a mountain just north of Hope in British Columbia. Most of it ended up on a stretch of CN Railroad track along the banks of the Fraser River. Then heavy rain dumped another half meter of dirty snow melt on top of it. The mess that CN's crews found when they arrived was just epic. Most people would have taken one look and given up. But CN's geotechnical engineer took a look and put his team to work. Five days later, trains were rolling along that track again. The fact is, a company that is basically the major veins and arteries of Canada's cardiovascular system has to be ready for any emergency. CN triggered its pandemic response plan back in January when the rest of the world was just beginning to take the disease seriously. CN support staff gathered to mix homemade sanitizer and assemble protective kits for the men and women who work out on the rails. And the vast majority of the company's workforce never stopped reporting for work. Because if the railroad stops, well, so does the economy. Simple as that. CN might run mostly out of sight, through forests and along rivers and over mountains. In places Gordon Lightfoot called too silent to be real. But it's the very definition of an essential service. All right. Hey, team. We're back for another week. Hi, Jenny. Hello. Hi. Hey, Scott. Hello. George Jones. Oh, I love George you. Jones. Well, who Would doesn't you love George like Jones? To take the grand tour. <laughs> he was the best. Do you know there's a there's a have you ever seen this uh, Tales from the Bus, this cartoon by the guy who did King of the Hill? They do this like documentary that's animated about country and western singers. And the one about George Jones, they take him to the hospital and the doctor tells his backup band, Where did you find this guy? And they go, Well, what do you mean? And he said, Well, his IQ is 60. And he's like, I've never seen anybody as dumb as 60. And they all look at one another and they go, yeah, well, look at us. Because we're so dumb, we're working for the guy who's got an IQ of 60. <laughs> anyway, he was great. A great singer, a great drunk, a great hero to me personally. Jenny, do you like country music? I love country music. I grew up on country music. Yeah. Including George Jones? Yep, I listen to him a bit. He Stopped Loving Her Today is a very sad song. Yes. Yeah. Well, they re he, he put that back out in the 90s. That he re they re 80s. released that. 81. Yeah, but they re-released really? it in the 90s. Oh, I'm sure they did, yeah. Yeah. Well, they should re-release it every couple of years. It's a fucking piece <laughs> of gold. <laughs> <laughs> hey. So, hey, what's up What's up with you two? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, of course, uh, not in Toronto and uh, watching things from a safe distance, but it doesn't appear that anybody has any fucking idea what to do in Toronto. What there, are the rules? Are, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? Nobody knows. There was, there were, I, I watched three different press conferences in the background uh, yesterday and they all told us totally different things. You could, don't go out of your house, go out of your house. You can talk to people you don't live with. You can't talk to people you live with. It's all completely like the advice now is from the city of Toronto to the province, to the provinces, two press conferences to TAM. They're all different. 
I went out yesterday for uh, fresh water batteries and hand saws. I'm ready. <laughs> it's getting a little, I mean, it's, you know, my kids today are back to school, so that's a positive, um, or I guess technically a negative. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, you get the feeling like we're, we're just, we're, we're in a decaying orbit, right? It's kind of like, you know, ground control, ground control. None of these buttons appear to be working. Is everything okay? And ground control radios up and says, you're fine. Just uh, talk a little to the left. And you're like, hmm, there seems to be no left. But yeah. Andre Picard wrote yesterday that the whole thing seems rudderless. And I think that he's right. I mean, uh, I, and I think that people are losing, people won't follow instructions they don't believe are, uh, are sound. And, I think that they've lost a lot of credibility. This whole Thanksgiving thing is like a bit of a laugh line. Yes. It's, but Nobody the, the will reason, tell you whether you're supposed to see your mom on Thanksgiving or not. But the reason that people aren't, uh, the people that people aren't listening is so you have the city of Toronto who announced on the weekend that uh, they've stopped doing any form of track and trace. They just, uh, they've just thrown up their hands. They're too far behind. They can't do it. Uh, but yet yesterday, and I, and I shouldn't, but I keep calling her Cruella DeVille because I can't remember what her actual name is, but Dr. DeVille from the star from the city of Toronto. Um, she comes out and says, well, we have to shut down restaurants. I can't do it personally, but we have to shut down restaurants because 45% of the new cases are coming from restaurants. How do you know that? Like, how do you know that if you're not fucking tracing it? Like, it's they're just making shit up. I, 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 I feel I should go and actually do one of these pressers and just make shit up and talk. <laughs> I mean, I guess I assume that this 44% number comes from tracing previously. I, I don't know. Like, but now if you don't have contact tracing, there's no way to identify what the source is, what the, uh, what the patterns of, uh, of uh, transmission are. And as a consequence, how do you make public policy or advise people what to do, what not to do? It's just Joker's Wild. It's like, listen, go out there. If you're stronger than the person next to you, beat them down and take their <laughs> shit. Like that's, uh, and we'll advise you in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I fell asleep on the couch uh, had a little nap yesterday evening and when I woke up I swear to God Mussolini was on the television <laughs> Very I don't know whether it was an old war, World War II movie but there was some guy standing up at the thing like this um, well, anyway, it's a strategy. So, uh, let's, let's start with our Mia Culpas. Let's start with our Mia Culpas because, uh, it appears if I'm going to defend us at all, it appears that many people actually saw the same thing in the debate that we saw in terms of Biden's weakness and Biden's vulnerabilities um, and I think that the evidence is that everybody who watched the debate wished there was somebody other than Biden running against Trump. But nonetheless, it also appears that Trump performance uh, did not translate into sport for him. In fact, translated into probably a loss of net two or three points for him on a national basis, uh, pushing him further away. So we didn't. Uh, you know, some of us were more on this than other. I'll just speak for myself. I didn't read the debate right. I, we are too cynical about people, and I'm re I'm refreshed that Americans looked at that debate and were appalled and not uh, and not uh, persuaded by Trump's performance. But having said all this, and having said, you know, we the whole campaign is a train wreck now, and people are talking about you know what kind of uh, wait, 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 wait. Can I be a bit gonna... Can I be a bit douchey for a second before you what? move on? Yeah. Oh, by I, the did, way, I said I said I thought that Biden had, law, had lost the debate but won the night. And I actually think yeah, that that comes right. fairly close to yeah. describing what occurred. That is it. Yeah, sorry, that's right. I forgot. You were right. Well, I and, don't and, like that. And and I'm not apologizing for anything. I if people you know, people can <laughs> so people fuck you <laughs> people early can, no one on this panel likes you no one <laughs> no one embraces your characterization of what occurred last week we don't even, were you here are you drunk right now 
I just, <laughs> I, listen, people, just because people wa- want to believe that Biden did better in the debate uh, than what he did, and it doesn't make it so. I would like to win a million dollars on Lotto Max tonight, but that doesn't mean that it's going to, uh, it's going to happen. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since the last Tuesday when the actual debate uh, debate happened, but I'm, I'm not taking back what I, what I said uh, in terms of uh, uh, my thoughts on the debate last week. All right. Okay. So I'll take, I'm not taking mine back either, but I'm saying I thought it might go better for Trump than it did. It didn't. So what I was about to say, though, is this thing is still not fucking over. Despite everything, despite that debate, despite the whole shit show around uh, his uh, infection with COVID, he's still within five points of enough states to win the presidency. I disagree with you. And I, I don't agree and with that. Why? Well, I, I, first of all, there's a new CNN poll out this morning, albeit it's national. If you look at what Nate Saver's been saying, is he now says that the odds of the Democrats flipping the Senate are now two to one in their favor, that that's been trending that way since the debate. I, I really do think, uh, and you know, we all try to hedge on these things, but I, I like declarative statement i've been emphatic since the friday morning i believe this is the end of his presidency i think it's more likely this thing's going to slide into the ocean and we're going to see spreads widen in those key states and nationally i think it's over i think the meta message that's taken from this is this guy can't he can't protect himself he can't protect the country there is no greater more obvious symbol of his failure than the fact that he had covid and now he's trying to tell us that he conquered it because he's superhuman. I don't think it tracks with his own supporters, much less a, an independent voter, much less a, someone who hates him already. I just think now the country is going to walk past him. I really think it's over. I think it's already starting to, like, la- he is Donald J. Fonzie. He's on his motorcycle and flying over the shark at, you know, Arnold's chicken stand. It is, I really think it is fucking Dunsies. But that's what you want. It is what I want, but it's genuinely what I think. So maybe I'll be wrong. But I really think we'll look back and look at that week, the combination of the debate performance with the COVID test, and people are just going to go, all right, done. And even his supporters, I think, are in a world now where it's like, he's going to lose, and therefore I've got to like find, you know, I, I got to go like make weapons well, in my basement you- or whatever those people I don't know are. Why you say, I don't know why what you evidence? say that, because yeah, more what people ev- think Trump's going to win the presidency than think Biden's going to win the presidency. Yeah, like, I don't know what evidence that you think the GOP voters, like, if you look at, like, I know we're going to get into some of the Senate races, but if you look in South Carolina, for example, there was a poll, and in terms of GOP voters, uh, 83% of GOP voters support Lindsey Graham, and like, 94% support Trump. Like Trump in, 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 in a lot of these Senate races uh, uh, is actually the draw. His his supporters, and I know, David, you've said this before, his supporters are more likely to go out and vote. Like they are the mo- they are motivated uh, to actually to, to go out and vote. So a lot of the that so which is which is not attributed to in the polls. One of the things the other thing we've talked about this before in terms of the polls is Hillary was leading up by 14 to 15 percent in some of the polls with a week left to go in the last uh, in the last presidential election. Because for the most part, a lot of people are just really too fucking afraid to tell anybody, including pollsters, that they're supporting Trump. I don't think that phenomenon takes hold anymore. And by the way, the polls last time were not incorrect on a national basis. They said she'd win by three or four. No, but the national she polls are irrelevant. Why are we? Yeah, exactly. I know, but I'm, I'm just saying people shit about on the polls. Other than and, as an indication of something. But I mean, like Trump's going to lose the popular vote by a mile because yeah. California is going to go eighty twenty. It doesn't. It, he's going to lose the popular. I vote think you're going to see. I think this thing's going to cascade. I think you're going to see in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it probably GOP. will. So Scott, it probably will, and that's probably the way it's going to go. And it will probably go that way because Trump's unable to do anything disciplined or strategic. But the point I was going to make at the beginning, and you know, I'm not a supporter of this or of his is that if any of us were involved in a campaign that with a month to go was down by five points, we would not be quitting. And we would not think that we had no chance of winning. We would still think that was well within, and we'd be fighting like dogs. Agreed. So while while when you watch CNN and MSNBC, what's that? Except if we were working with Trump, we'd be in the hospital. We'd be like Chris Christie. We'd be like, could I get some food that's not solid, please? Yeah, but that, you're just, right. you're just, you're, you're just, this is the thing. You're just like, you're just throwing out. I these was art, joking. Like, I was joking. I know I was making a prediction on the broad stuff there. I was just joking. I do think it's going to cascade. And I think there's evidence that it is starting to cascade. 
What could he possibly do at this point? Well, I think he's going to continue doing what he's doing. I think the I think the reason that he, you know, uh, stood and, and saluted Marine One as they took off and the reason he did the motorcade and the motorcade thing was extremely bizarre. I'm not defending it, but I think the reason he did it is you have, you know, all these reports that you're on death's door. You have your own chief of staff out telling the pool that, you know, you're doing worse than what you're you're trying to let on. He's trying to show his supporters he's actually fine. See, I'm good. I'm not dead. I'm not on oxygen. I'm all good. That that is the purpose as to why I think he did the drive by and why he he did what he did last night in terms of you know standing on the you know and, and he got out of Marine One. He walked up the two flights of stairs. He was trying to show people that I am fine. I am back. I had COVID, but I. Um, I, I have survived it and I'm, I am going on. So, um, if, if you're Trump, why are you changing any of the tactics that have worked for you for the last five years? Because you're losing. Yeah, I'll but he does have do. to make up, does have to make up five to seven points in a lot of states. So I, yep. as I said, it's not something you quit in the face of, but it's obviously something that requires some alteration, some new message, some new factoid, some new something. I agree with Jenny. He's that, going to continue to do what he does. Yeah. But if we're playing make-believe, if we're playing like, you know, uh, fantasy life here, um, if you're running his campaign, and because it's fantasy and because it's Trump, you can say anything you want, um, I would do three things. One, I would say my experience in these last number of days in terms of the health system reminds me that we cannot be excluding people from health and, 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 and reliable health care. And as a consequence, this debate about pre-existing conditions is over. I'm ordering all of those initiatives killed. I'm going to support uh, initiatives that will, uh, that will protect pre-existing conditions. I would do whatever it takes, executive order, declarations, fight with McConnell. I would do something that would say, I'm on that side of this debate firmly. Second, I would say to people, since I'm already promising there's going to be a, a vaccine momentarily, that I deploy the armed forces. We'll have big mash tents out there. We're going to do, not only are we going to get the vaccine, but we're going to have the most rapid distribution of it once it's available. And we're going to use the full force of the American military to ensure that it's deployed on a mass level. You're going to get it. Your family's going to get it. Your daughter, your cousin, your uncle's going to get it. And there's not going to be any uh, co-payment or bullshit fee for it. This is a federal government is picking up the tab and we are going to make sure you get it fast. And then the final thing I would do is I'd declare a bunch of tax-free zones and mass attacks and sentence for small business. And I would do that unapologetically, shamelessly, horror-ishly in uh, core swing states and say, I'm going to go through that rust belt and make sure that we do, uh, we put it right to the pedal. We put the pedal right to the, uh, to the floor uh, in terms of uh, reviving existing business and attracting new business. Uh, and I would just do it right on the map of where he needs those electoral college votes. I would do all those things and I would pound away on that stuff. Um, yeah, but I don't, I, I think, by the way, it's not, none of those things are possible to do, but they're impossible for him to do because he can't stay on message. He'll talk about himself all day, every day. Well, but I think that is his message. I think, I think he is, I think in his, I think he is strategic, even though the three of us don't agree with it because we've never thankfully worked for a politician like Donald Trump. I can't imagine being his staffer, but he is his own counsel. He is his own strategist. He does his, uh, he does his own thing. I, I actually I agree with you on most of those points, Scott. I think that also you're going to, if you're his campaign, you're going in and targeting. We talked about uh, last week the uh, the fact that uh, Biden talked about um, uh, scrapping the uh, the Trump tax cuts, especially in places like Florida. If you look at, um, uh, he has he has well over fifty percent of uh, of the Cuban uh, uh, Cuban support Cuban Americans in uh, in Florida, sixty uh, percent in Miami Dade, for example. You're going in and you're targeting that message. Uh, and you're going in and making sure those people are going to uh, vote uh, in a month's time uh, uh, during the election. So I'm interested in debate tactics for the next two de for the next two presidential debates because because I think everything you guys have said is really smart and makes a lot of sense on the positive ledger. Remind people, give people a reason to vote for for Trump. But I. My theory would be that Trump can only win if Biden is disqualified. And so that's what Trump started to try to do in the first debate was to disqualify Biden. And I think he has to continue that. But he, he obviously has to do it differently. Do you have any thoughts about that, about 
how he can continue to demonstrate Biden's weakness, frailty in the debates without coming off as such a jerk. Because it is hard. I mean, he was obviously way over the top. But in any circumstance in a debate, it's hard to be negative and critical and come off well yourself in the in the process, if you know yep. what I mean. So he kind of has to do this job himself, but he has to do it in a way that doesn't make people conclude that he's a raving asshole. So... Well, and, and, and they've already come out, the debate commission has already come out and said that they're going to structure it differently, as in like the moderator or the debate commission will have access to mics, I think. So the format that, uh, that we saw last week uh, isn't going to happen. Uh, but there's been nothing else other than that. So it will be harder for Trump to interject. My guess is if they do the debate in, uh, in person, um, it'll be the same as we're, we're going to see tomorrow night with the vice presidential debate. There's going to be like a plexiglass uh, between the uh, uh, between the two uh, between the two two men, um, which I, I like, which I think would be even though it's clear, I think would be off putting if you actually are trying to turn and get that moment where you're you're trying to even if there's like a plastic shield between you, it it, it takes something away with it. So, well, I, I think there's like ifs. I'm very curious: is this going to be in person? Is this going to be? on zoom is this like what are what are the results like what are the uh the rules going to be and maybe if you're if you're trump it's less about uh the debate and it's stuff that you put out like joe biden continues to be extremely strange there was a clip that was going around yesterday uh that had him speaking and and uh he said he he was sitting at a table and i don't know what question he was asked but the quote that he said was you know uh i was able to be sequestered in my home because some black woman was able to stock the grocery shelves uh, during the, the, the lockdown. And it was kind of like, there's like, what do you even say to that? Uh, so, so I think, I think probably you're going to see the Trump, Trump campaign. It'll be less probably focus on the debates uh, as opposed to probably some more of the stuff you're going to push out through your packs and, and, you know, black ops and what have you. The history of presidential debates is that if they matter at all, the first one matters. So, I mean, I think I think probably, I mean, you have to prepare for them and try to take advantage of them if you're Trump because there are opportunities to try to gain ground. Um, but I think, you know, mo as Jenny says, I think most of the, if there's if there's a strategy to be implemented, it will likely be outside of the debates. But if if I was if I was coaching Trump, and I know it's like an you know, it's impossible to coach this guy, right? Like, it's like trying to teach a donkey to play the piano. It's like, good luck, right? Uh, hey, he just keeps clanging the keys. Well, that's what he does. Um, but, you know, I, I think I, I would actually, one thing I would tell him to keep doing, not just, just like, turn the asshole to seven instead of 12, right? So one thing I would make sure he does is he got, he's, we know that Biden, um, when his rhythm is interrupted, he reboots. He doesn't pick back up, right? So if I was coaching Biden, I'd be saying, you got to get a plan out there. You got to be talking about, I'm going to be doing the next, I'm going to, these four actions, these five initiatives, all that kind of stuff. So I would jam in there and I would keep interrupting him. I wouldn't coach him to back off too much. I would have him keep interrupting Biden so he doesn't get that clear info commercial stuff out. Because um, if he does, that, that could be harmful to Trump. And then, you know, if I was Trump, I would just go on taxes, I, I would I would go on taxes and just hammer and hammer and hammer and say you're going to take away our tax cuts you're going to do that and I because if you think about wh who the voters that are available to Trump right the 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 people that are going to be watching that um, they're not they're not the crazies right the crazies you know whatever they're watching like. Uh, God only knows. But uh, I, I think you're talking about people that are going to be more sensitive to the tax argument. So I would hammer away on the taxing, get Biden to make a mistake on taxes, get him to admit that he was going to you know, raise taxes or freak him out somehow. And I would just try to take that as an objective and package that. And maybe I'd yell, boo, really loud and see if like he just collapses, you know, falls down and breaks his hip or something. So isn't this second debate, isn't the second debate a town hall format? Isn't that usually what the second debate is? Is a town hall format? I think but, so. But will they I be able so. to? Yes, but will they be able to continue with that in the current? That's situation? the format that sunk George H. W. Bush against yeah. Bill Clinton, because that's the debate where he he, he was Groceries. he looked at his watch while a person was asking him a question. It's like, how the fuck do I have to be here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Trump could be terrible in town hall, right? I mean, like his oh inability to empathize Empathy. with people. <laughs> it's just, it's, Let me tell you about so myself. Be, yeah, it'd be fun. But can they yeah, but, do a town hall? 
But everybody that well, they could do it. They, they, I think they can make anything work. Like, but they, asshole should be in isolation. <laughs> he just tested positive for Christ's sake. How do you put a group of people in the same room with them? No, but I mean, now the presidents come by and lick your palm. But why can't? But why can't you do? Why can't you do it? Uh, why can't they do it? Uh, the you know, people in one room and then the candidates on the screen. I'm in the uh, like, like, tr like Kennedy and and Nixon game debate moves. did one of did one of their debates uh, virtual like from different uh, sides of the country in like 1960. So I'm sure that uh, these smart networks with holograms and shit can figure something out. Trump went into the hospital and Biden pulled his negative ads. Mistake. Did he put them back on? Yes. I think they put them back on last night. I think they started. Yeah. It was a mistake to pull them. But nobody gives a shit about that. And Donald J. Trump and his campaign never would have done that. It's it's everyone. It's it's this thing where you feel all warm and fuzzy. Oh, I'm going to pull my ads. Poor Donald Trump. Uh, it was a mistake. They should have kept them going. I would have ramped them up. I don't think it mattered much. But as soon as Trump said, I'm not doing anything different, kiss my ass, I would have said, all right, fine. And I would have put him back up then. I wouldn't have even waited until he was out of the hospital. I do an ad of his doctor. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so while i remain obsessed with the uh holy christ that doctor's ruined himself eh just a joke just completely like, gruesome why would he have done that to himself amazing um so uh while i remain obsessed about the 20 percent or 25 percent chance that trump could win the election there's a that means that there's a 75 or 80 percent chance he's going to lose the election and there's probably as good a chance that he's going to lose it very very badly than that he's going to win it and the trend line would have you worried that he's going to lose it very very badly so when president when the top of the ticket does very very poorly it tends to drag down everybody else on the ticket the senate senatorial candidates the congressional candidates the dog catcher and sheriff candidates, everybody who's running under a Republican banner will uh, find fewer Republican votes there because uh, Trump is getting smoked. So uh, whether it's Walter Mondale in 1984 or uh, Bob Dole in 1996, uh, the down ballot candidates start to try to carve out their own play and try to uh, try to distance themselves from a losing candidate, uh, losing presidential candidate. I don't think that's possible with Trump. I think Trump has so identified the Republican Party now, and the Republican Party has so identified with Trump, and these congressional candidates have so moved in lockstep with him, particularly because in order to win their nominations, they had to move in lockstep with him, that it's not really credibly possible for anybody to distance themselves from him anymore. Even if you could, Jenny, would you recommend it? Well, I don't think they can. And and David, you said it earlier in the podcast that we shouldn't be looking at polls. Like, I'm not sure where you get that Trump is going to get smoked. He's got a 25 percent chance of, of winning. I think a lot of it is going to come out to turn out. And as I said, I think his people are much more motivated to turn out than what um, uh, than what uh, Democrat voters are. Uh, uh, he has got a very core loyal base, more so than what Joe Biden has. He, Biden doesn't have people that identify simply as Biden voters. Trump has a whole army of people that identify as as Trump voters. And I think that, you know, as I said about the Lindsey Graham, the fact that Trump polls nine to 11 points higher than what he does among GOP voters uh, in South Carolina means that uh, even if he wanted to try to distance himself, there's a reason he went from four years ago calling him a buffoon uh, to, to defending him now is because the people that he needs to vote for him are actually uh, are Trump supporters. He needs those Trump supporters that to- That Polaroids. To, uh, uh, to go out and, uh, and support him. And the same are gonna be in states like uh, like Florida. So I, I think that, I think that, you know, to your point, I'm not sure, I'm not sure a Republican uh, Senate, anyone, uh, any Senate uh, senators uh, uh, running or potential senators running can, uh, uh, can distance themselves. And I think in a lot of cases, I'm not sure why they would want to. So a couple things. Um, one, although it's a, a, a sideways um, uh, turn, uh, I would just say I really don't agree, and I think it will be super interesting to find out. I really don't agree with Jenny on turnout. I think you're starting to see, uh, I think there's all sorts of indications that um, turnout is going to be large, 
And I think you're going to find that those who are committed to defeating Trump are going to be so intergalactically motivated that, you know, Biden is the beneficiary of it. There isn't a Biden army. There aren't people going, I am for the guy with the teeth. I am on team teeth. That's not happening. But there's, uh, I think Trump, as, mu as much as he motivates his own base, I think that he's motivated the rest of the country. And I think that it will look like it happened. And 2018 is the only real dry run we've had for this. And, um, and, and, and Trump galvanized people. Um, and so I think, I think that will work to his disadvantage. But in terms of the Senate thing, I agree with both of you. I don't really think it's practical or possible because there's not a, I mean, he's such an unconventional candidate. It's not like you can be running in a Senate race in South Carolina, as an example, or someplace less high profile and say, well, you know, I'm going to distance myself from Trump because, you know, it's not like Trump is a policy. It isn't like there's a some issue that you can um, take uh, distance from. It's him. So, the you know, so you're kind of obligated to go, well, I don't like him. Well, you can't say I don't like him without violating uh, your Republican base there. Uh, if you were going to try to do it, You'd pick, I think the thing you would do is you would try to pick up a, a position that Trump has taken that people probably don't even know about, but identify some issue that Trump has uh, championed and say, here's an example of something that Donald Trump, the president, has championed. I don't like this. I've told him this. I'm not for this. And therefore, you can elect me knowing that I am the kind of person that will differ with the powers that be and the president if that's what I think makes sense for my constituents. Um, but I think you'd have to use a micro example, and I don't know that they'd be very convincing. So I, you, you could try it, but unless you're Susan Collins and you've been laying track for three years that you're going to differ with him from time to time, I don't think you can distance yourself with 10 or 20 days to go. Well, and she's one of the senators they 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 feel will will lose. So, but but this was the exact same thing in terms of turnout that people were talking about in 2016. Uh, and in fact, it was the high, voter turnout was higher than it ever has been. It was a, what 138 million Americans voted, and it ended up being for Trump. I think what the Democrats need to do um, is they need to figure out a way uh, to get uh, Black Americans out to vote because turnout between 2012 and 2016 uh, uh, went down dra dramatically among uh, among uh, Black voters. It was 67% in 2012 uh, when Obama was the uh, candidate and it went down to 60% uh, in, uh, in 20, uh, 2016. So I think if you're the Democrats and if you're Hillary's team who did a postmortem, that is part of the reason that caused, uh, that is part of the reason that caused uh, your defeat because a core constituency that you were, uh, that you were counting on and probably were attributed to in polls didn't actually come out and vote. And that's why the party ganged up, pulled candidates on the same day and rallied behind Biden, because he has demonstrated his ability to pull uh, black voters in a way that Hillary couldn't, and other candidates couldn't. If it had been Bernie, it would have been a real nightmare. Um, and I think that Biden again will be the the kind of genericized beneficiary of it. It isn't like he has some personal attachment, but he's going to be able um, to draw those votes in in a way that um, Hillary didn't. And again, I just I, I think it, you have to look at 2018. It's the most recent and obvious example, and I think turnout is. Um, Turnout's going to be a big problem for Trump because uh, well, I mean, it depends on what your theory of turnout is, but I think you're both really right to be talking about turnout. I think the biggest change in the way politics is conducted and the way campaigns are conducted in my lifetime is the change from them being primarily about persuasion and trying to convince people to vote for you and support you, and toward motivation and making sure that the people that support you actually turn out to vote. Um, and I think campaigns are more about motivation than they are about persuasion. Now, that's certainly true in the States and also somewhat true in Canada. So, um, and I, you know, I, Trump has generally had a pretty highly motivated core of voters. It feels, Scott, in our worlds of CNN, MSNBC, coastal elites, that there's a strong motivation to get rid of them. I just don't know uh, how that feels in Georgia. I don't know what that's well, like in Georgia. Well, I, as someone that watches Fox, uh, I, I can tell you that, that it's a much different feeling uh, than what you guys are seeing on CNN and MSNBC. On Friday night, um, I, I, was, I was switching between, my friend and I were switching between uh, CNN and Fox in terms of 
uh, in terms of Trump being admitted to Walter Reed. And it was like night and day different. You'd think you were on different planets. You had, you know, Fox going, you know, he's going to get over this. Look at he, him. He's the president. They were showing clips of Reagan at Walter Reed and Eisenhower at Walter Reed. And then you had like people on talking that basically Donald Trump's on death's door. Like if he makes it out, of, if he makes it the weekend, we're all going to be like shocked. It is night and day difference in terms of how people are uh, people are getting their uh, people are getting their news. No question. That's a it is always one. shocking to juxtapose those networks and realize that people are literally seeing two different realities, not two versions of the same reality, but two different realities altogether, depending yeah. on what you're watching and consuming. But, you know, uh, that's right. It's like a Margaret Atwood novel. It's terrifying. But, you know, um, or even Margaret Atwood herself, a bit terrifying. But um, <laughs> I got a Margaret Atwood story I'll tell someday. Uh, <laughs> But um, Margaret Atwood's a fan of the pod. Is she? Yeah. Get out. Yeah. Well, uh, there you have it. Um, I, uh, you know, I just, okay, I know I'm all wet. I know I'm all wet, and you guys can just dismiss it as being all wet. But I, <laughs> I, I, I think there is, I think that the galvanizing reality that is Trump is galvanizing anti more than pro. And I, I mean, if you listen to what his own team says outside of the surreal world of Fox, what they say is that the way they're going to win is they're going to surface voters that have not voted in the past and didn't even vote in 2016. They're going to get non-college whites who are the kind of people who say, fuck it, I don't believe in voting. It doesn't make any difference. But I do like Trump. They're going to get them to cast their first ballot in history. And that is an entirely rational strategy. But boy, oh boy, uh, it, like we all know how hard it is to get people who've never voted before to vote. And if that's, if that's your pathway to victory, it's pretty narrow. Um, I think they're fucked. I don't I think, think, I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that's their only pathway. It's, it's what we've talked about. It's voter turnout. He had 66 million people that voted for him in the last, uh, uh, last election. That's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good, uh, base to, uh, to start with for any Could candidate. COVID be demotivating to those people? There's been, it, it's such a breach of, uh, uh, of narrative that, you know, he was like, it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. Only the weak catch it. Now he's caught it and he's attempting to say, well, I overcame it. But is that, is it in any way, does it demotivate some of his people or just kind of go, wow, well, fuck. I don't, I don't think so. Huh? Okay. I don't think so. Nothing matters until it does. That's the rule. Nothing about Trump matters until it does. Uh, <laughs> so it's about it's true of politics and true of my birthmark but anyway <laughs> so i didn't mean matter I, until there, it started there's a, to itch doc <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh you know there's another event coming up this week and ever since ever since uh mike pence faced off against the legendary tim kane four years ago <laughs> I have been waiting, <laughs> waiting for the next vice presidential debate. Um, and so uh, this week, and maybe this one's a little bit more interesting than normal because Kamala Harris is part of it, and she's more interesting than your normal vice presidential candidate, certainly more interesting than Tim Kaine. Um, Pence is a pretty good debater, but she's a pretty good debater, and she's a pretty aggressive person. Um, what do you think that Democrats want her to accomplish with pants? Scott, go ahead. Uh, you know, I first of all, I think the vice presidency has probably never mattered more um, because if either of these people get elected or reelected, um, the ones sitting next to them may find themselves in charge before too long. Um, so, there's that, but I'm not convinced that the vice presidential debate will be consequential. Uh, if I was a Democrat, I'd actually be looking for, I'm going to reach back six, seven minutes into the pod, talk about what Jenny mentioned. I'd be, I'd be looking not so much for Kamala Harris to go in there and to carve Pence into strips of bacon, oh, as much fun as it would be to watch that. Um, and in fact, I think that would likely backfire. Uh, you just can't get away with being uh, strong and aggressive if you're a woman. It's just a it's a fucking unfair rule. So the tougher she is Say on him, a black woman. Say it. A She's black, a black woman. woman. Yeah. So a black woman, she beats the living shit out of him and throws him around the room. You're going to get a bunch of crap coverage about how you know she's too aggressive and too, um, you know, 
too bear fanged and all that kind of stuff. I, I think what she wants to do is she wants to hammer on themes that are motivating to the Democratic base, to the traditional Democratic base that um, – that you know they need so black voters for sure but lower income voters the whole like get labor get the traditional democratic constituency excited um so i would i would want to hammer on that and uh and and not worry as much about um mission destruct on on uh pence i don't think it's about tearing pence down i think it's about trying to animate and make those those base voters feel good who some of them may not feel as affiliated like the aoc voter isn't as excited about biden so kamala's job is to make those people feel excited yeah the Jay, part you I got... would just... sorry yeah go ahead I, I... No, no, Listen, no. I, 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 I agree uh, to a certain extent. I don't, I don't think that, I think the Democrats have a different problem than the Republicans in terms of, you know, you said that people should watch because either of these guys could end up, either of these candidates could end up being president. I don't think that's the case uh, with uh, Republicans. And I don't think anyone, I think if Trump wins, people don't think that he's going to, something's going to happen to him in four years and, and, and Pence will take over. I think though, with, with uh, people that are concerned about Biden and his health, uh, 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 this is their chance to see uh, what Kamala uh, actually has to offer. So I think that there's going to be a lot more eyes on her. And to your point, um, uh, I think that it's going to be less for her debating Pence. Um, I think she can hold her own. I think she's smart. She's capable. It's going to be her introduction, essentially, to uh, as uh, to a potential president. People. Yes. Right. Yeah. She's got to make them I, comfortable. Exactly. That she, that if she's is, the president in two years, that's OK. Exactly. Right? That, that is what I think mm -hmm. the objectives of the Democrats are. I think it's less about the debate. Pence is just going to be a guy that that stands beside her on stage uh, with a plexiglass wall between them. Can I add one quick thing that's not about the debate? So that probably means she's not attacking at all, eh? That probably means she's probably in presidential I, mode. She will be more contrasting. So it's not, take away the attack, it'll be contrast. She'll contrast herself with, she'll contrast herself with Trump. She'll contrast herself with certain Republican policies. But I don't think her, I don't think it's going to be a, it's not, it's going to not be as feisty as what uh, the presidential debate was last week. Can I just add w one thought that I don't think we've touched on, but we've all worked in government. And so I think... We would agree on this. Everyone's talking about, well, if the Democrats are elected and Biden's president, you know, it really matters. Vice President Kamala Harris, she's got to be there. She may well end up in that role before the term is over and all this stuff. One of the, we all know that it's a long way down that hallway to the vice president as long as, pre, as, long as Biden is president. And if you think that Biden is not running at 100%, then the first and most important decision that would be made is who's his chief of staff? Because that means his chief of staff is going to be really running the show. And it'll be interesting to see if a Biden White House, if there's a huge tension between the Biden Oval and the vice president's office. Like, will we see tensions there? I think that is going to be a really interesting drama to watch in, in the months to come if, um, if, in fact, they win. Okay. Hey, Jenny, I've got a question, uh, a genuine question. Does the Trump campaign have any money? Why are they getting beaten so badly on television? I thought they were like a month ago. I thought they were yeah. just phasing and waiting, biding their time. But are they? Do they have it? Do they have money problems? I, I have no idea. It, it depends on which reports you see. There, there are articles that they've run out of money, and therefore that's why they're, um, that's why they're off the air, and that's why uh, uh, they're getting it's you know what three to one almost with uh, uh, Biden. Biden ads and Biden pack ads, as opposed to uh, to Trump. Um, if you hear some spin out of his campaign, it's the oh, we're focusing more targeted uh, online, and you know we've still got a month to go. So it's hard to say. It could be it could be either it could be either or. I don't actually like. I don't think I don't actually know it, what, what which which it is. I guess we'll see if we're sitting here in two weeks and there still hasn't been kind of a ramp up of of uh, of GOP ads. Then I get one would say that probably they've got money problems. I think that because yeah, you and I were both agreeing earlier that they, you know, five points down is with a month to go is not the end of the world. You could conceivably do that, but, but not need, without air superiority, you, not without you need air money. Superiority. It's, you need money. Yeah. yeah. That our, our ads are more targeted and less visible to you is the equivalent to my grade 10. I have a girlfriend in Niagara Falls. You've just never met her. And we're for sure having sex. That is bullshit. Unprovable. <laughs> Hey, let's swing back to Canada. The Green Party, after a tumultuous 
leadership campaign, which didn't get as much attention as it might have gotten. But boy, there was a lot of stuff going on internally in that race for uh, um, a fourth party. They elected a leader, and looks to me like they made the right choice. Looks to me like they made a smart choice. Looks to me like uh, uh, they've got somebody that intends to bring their game on the left side of the spectrum, and I think that there's room there. So... Is this, a, is this a substantial change in the Canadian political dynamic, either one of you? I think it is. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Paul seems like a great, uh, a great candidate. She won on the, uh, on the eighth ballot, uh, the first uh, um, uh, black woman to be elected uh, to, uh, to a federal leadership race. People were saying the first black woman, but I guess Vivian Barbeau from the Bloc was the interim leader for, uh, for a period after, uh, after Duceppe lost. I had forgotten about that. Um, I, I, and she's extremely smart, fluently bilingual, uh, probably, uh, next to Trudeau, the most fluently bilingual, uh, uh, leader among the, um, uh, among the other, uh, other leaders. Uh, so I think she's great. And it also, uh, it is time for the green party. We, we saw it with Elizabeth May and I know, uh, uh, David, you're, you're a big fan. And she, she, she did, she was leader for, what, 12 years, if longer than that. Uh, but if yeah. this party wants to actually get past there, that seems to be right now they're stealing with her was three seats and expectations were very high for her in the last election. They need a bit of a change. And I think uh, having a new leader uh, to put uh, to put her stamp on it, um, I, you know, she's more based out of out of Ontario, uh, I, I think is uh, I think is very good. If I was a green uh, if I was a green supporter, or a green uh, member, I'd be very happy uh, right now. I agree with all that. I think she's exciting. I think she piques interest, and I think she will uh, attract eyeballs uh, to the party. And people will go, I'd like to know what's going on. And I think if they had elected um, some, you know, there are other candidates in that race. I'm not sure that people would have said, okay, I'm going to like, I'm, I'm going to beat a path to their door to find out what they're uh, what they're selling. Um, I think it's well, the person who finished second would have blown the whole thing to smithereens, right? Yeah, like that sure. would have taken right. them. They they faced a core choice: fringe or mainstream right. and they chose mainstream yeah. yeah they did and and she's got game and and because she's a black woman uh because she's so fluently bilingual um she's also kind of exciting right like she sort of brings like you're like wow there's some energy here i'd like to know what this is all about so but to me the question is whether they can leverage that because i i as jenny said i thought liz may had breakthrough potential a couple of times and she's a friend like as with you and i um maybe i was oh obscured by that fact, but I really thought she had breakthrough potential and it didn't happen. And so to my mind, it's how do you go from, okay, we've chosen the person who's going to attract interest to we've chosen the person who can confirm people's interest. And what are they going to be about? I'm not sure what the Green Party's about these days uh, at the federal level. Like, is it a strict climate change issue? Is it uh, going to incorporate other issues? How does, how does that work? How mainstream will they feel and present? So I think all that... All that, all that remains to be seen. And so, you know, we'll see. Um, but she gives them, uh, she gives them a moment uh, to distract people and to say, okay, I, it's, it's on my radar screen. I'm willing to consider it. And she's just got to make the most of that moment. I think she's about, I think she made it clear that it's now, and this is a big distinction from when Liz was running it. Because I don't think Elizabeth brought this kind of intellectual coherence to it outside of climate, they're a social democratic party. They're an unabashed social democratic uh, party, and they're comp they intend to displace the new Democrats. They were almost explicit about that. Um, and, you know, I think there's a big, I think there's a, I, th I think there's a big chunk of votes on the left these days. I think there's more appetite on the left for left-wing ideas than there was before COVID, and there was a fair bit before COVID. And it, it's a real choice for the Liberal Party how much they think they can absorb of that before opening up flanks on the on the on the center right to to O'Toole. So this is, I think, uh, I I think that she's got way more game than Singh. I saw one speech and I knew that she's got way more yeah. game than Singh. Way. Agreed. And way. she's more strategic than Singh. And so yeah. I I I could see them eating the NDP's lunch. And I'm just saying, I think there's a lot of space out there. Um, on both climate and on social democracy, uh, it's not enough to it's not enough to win an election. But it's it, the Liberal Party needs a big chunk of those votes, and to have a hungry competitor out there is not good. Does it benefit the Liberal Party 
if they get 17% of the vote and it blows apart the NDP and creates big splits on the left? Or is it actually splitting that chunk of votes three ways and causes horrifying victories in weird places for the conservatives? You know what I mean? Like, like I know I'm jumping seven steps ahead, but you know, like mm. it's, you think, well, if it's bad, for the NDP, is it good for the Liberals? But it and it, it may be, it may not be. It's so it's all it almost becomes arithmetic, right? It depends on exactly how they cut in and where they cut in. Right. Yeah, I guess we'll see. There are a lot of a lot, of, you know. There's a aggressive fishing in the Liberal Party's vote pool right now. Right. Right. Uh, we have to go. We have to quit, even though we can go on forever. We have to quit because Scott has to go off and do. Uh, color commentary uh to uh, john on john turner's funeral on ctv so this will be aired after he does that so it can't be a heads up to watch him but good luck scott and do Thank us you, all sir. proud there I and shall, uh I will i shall be changing my right. shirt in a moment right. we had a mailbag question and uh if you want to hear that mailbag question we don't have time to do it right now but if you want to hear it you can go to uh airquotesmedia.com uh probably in a day or so and that will be posted there and you can hear us answer uh but I think is a pretty interesting mailbag question, but I'm not going to tease it any more than that. So everybody, <laughs> thanks for listening. Uh, Jenny and Scott, thanks a lot for being uh, here today. It was fun. John Stackhouse, thank you for coming on. So interesting as always. The Air Quotes media team, particularly Metal and Jill, uh, thanks uh, so much for everything. And uh, listeners, uh, thanks very much. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take care of yourselves in the meantime. Bye-bye. Toodles. 